man, everyone showed up tonight. I can't believe it. I, I, know, I know what you're thinking. You're like, there's only two more. We're going to go out. There's only two more. No. Um, yeah, there is only two more, but they told you guys um, we're starting back up in January. Uh, the, January the 1st, Thursday, the 8th of January. We're starting up again here. But until then, uh, they have a Monday night deal that they, uh, that they teach here. If you guys, if this is the only service you go to, they have Wednesday nights, they have Sunday nights. But stay plugged in, dude, because if you don't stay plugged in, you know what happens? Yeah. Get off, off track, you get caught with your pants down, all kinds of funky stuff, you know? <laughs> Literally, you could get what you're caught with your pants down, and that ain't good. Um, some of you guys know what I'm talking about, huh? You go into your girlfriend's house, and I'm going to lay my hands on her and pray for her. That's when you get what you caught, caught with your hand, pants down. Um, stay plugged in. Stay plugged in. Stay in the word. Remember when I told you guys last week, read, pray, grow. Did I tell you guys that, that last week? Okay, read, pray, grow. Every single day, uh, we're just this walk as we follow God. And as Jesus disciples us, we spend time with him. We read, we pray. He tells us what he wants us to do with our life. He tells us our plan. Uh, he doesn't lord over us. Over us, We call him lord because we're submitted to him because we know that he knows best. And if any of you guys live a life that, like me where you have used to live a life of chaos and craziness, you got yourself into some situations and uh, you gave your life to God and you realized what he's done in your life that you're like, I would never go back to that. Are you kidding me? You know? That's, that's why we call him Lord, because he's taken us out of that miry clay, and we put our feet on the rock, which he's the rock, and uh, he walks with us, man. It's awesome, you know? We're not perfect, rough around the edges, but God starts transforming our minds. He starts renewing us. He changes our heart. Those things that we used to want to do, we don't do, not because if we live with a bunch of rules and regulations. You're just like, you're going to do something, and you're like, wait, I don't want to do that. And you're like, why don't I want to go smoke weed? I like weed. Why would I not want to do that? Why would I not go, want to go out and get wasted? Why would I not want to go out and sleep with a bunch of chicks? Why? Because the word of God says he makes us a new creation. He transforms our minds and our hearts. So that's why he's our Lord. And through doing that and surrender to him going, okay, God, whatever you want to do in my life, let's do this. He gives us peace. That empty void that we have in our, in our, in our lives that we try and fill it with all these things with success Oh, if I just had this job, or if I just had that hot chick, or, you know, if I just had that seven series, if I just had that house, or it's like on and on and on. And then you get those things, oh, I got the seven series. Dang, I got to get rims. Then you get the rims, dang, I got to tint the windows, I got to get the sound system. I mean, nothing ever satisfies you, you know? It's just about, it's all about the chase. Chasing to get what you don't have, and then you get it, and then you're like, what's next? And that's like that dog that I talked to you about that doesn't have that tail, but it keeps chasing itself around in circles and circles. It's like, if I could just grab that tail, I would be happy. You know, that dog, that little chihuahua or whatever, don't have tails, rawr, 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 you know, and they never catch that tail. But if they would, they thought they would be happy, but they wouldn't. And that's the way it is with our lives is what we don't have, we think, you know, if we get it, we'll be happy. But God is the only one that puts that, he places his spirit inside of us, the Holy Spirit. And when it comes inside of us, it, it fills that empty void that purpose. My wife, dude, she was super successful. You know, used to manage Sean White, the pro snowboarder, for six years, working for that company, worked for the Facebook Brothers in finance. She uh, worked for Red Bull for six years or eight years. She was in there making cash, making way more money than I ever made. Shoot. Uh, that's why I married her. No, I'm just joking. Um, but uh, no, she, uh, but late at night when she would go to bed, she would uh, say, when, when, all that distra when all the distractions left, when she wasn't at the cool parties or at the cool events, she'd be by herself in her room, and she would just feel, I had this empty void. And I didn't know what it was. And she used to go to church. She was the kind of Christian that, you know, uh, that would go once a month to church and thought she had a relationship with God but didn't know the word of God. You know, she grew up a Catholic girl her whole life. And uh, she grew up, you know, Catholicism was like religion. You know, you go live like hell, and then you go... Do your, you know, you know, you say your prayer, and then you go back out to the parking lot, roll a blunt, and go get wasted, right? You know, then I'll, I'll make it. You go talk to the good old priest, you know, next Sunday, you know, if I'm not too hungover, <laughs> huh? So, you know what I'm talking about. So, but when I, 
met her here at the first shine that I've ever did. And I remember telling people, I'd be like, man, I need to go start a night in Orange County, man, because I've been living in Orange County for the last 20 years, you know? I need to go start a study in Orange County, man, then I'm going to find my wife, you know? And, I, you know, then also, you know, that was just a joke. But then what happened is the first night I, of the first Bible study, I met her. It was crazy, which I didn't even date, date her until later on. But, you know, I introduced her to Chuck Smith book, Living Water book. And, uh, and the reason why I said I had to meet a girl in Orange County, because I had rules. She has to live 10 minutes from my house. Um, she had to be, a, she had to be um, from, like, you know, south of the border, you know, from anywhere from Mexico down, because I only like brown. I don't like white, brown. Spaniards are cool, you know, over there in Europe, they're cool. But, uh, but anyway, I had all these rules, you know, and she basically, she was everything, you know. She, she lived 10 minutes from my house, you know, blah, 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 but she didn't have Jesus at that time. She was religious. So I gave her the book, The Living Water, gives, uh, the Living Water by Chuck Smith, and she read it. And uh, basically one day, she, she was out working for the Facebook brothers, the twin brothers um, out in New York at that time. And uh, she just called me up one day, and she said, she texted me. I'm on the plane right now. She's like, I just got to page, you know, 54 in Living Water, and Chuck Smith says not to turn the page unless I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And she says, I read that thing like six times, and she said, I realized I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I said, Jesus, come into my life. And she said, and then I just started crying, and people were looking at me like I'm a weirdo on the plane. And I just texted her back. I said, the God of the universe is reaching down. He's making himself real to you. And then she took off on a plane. And probably, I don't know what was going on in her head during that time for five hours back to L.A. But she showed up here. Then I took her to go see John Randall teach. And John Randall started giving, he gave this message of like repentance. I was just like, whatever. I was like, I was kind of whatever in the message. But John Randall, normally when he speaks, I'm like, I got to give my life back to Jesus. And I got to <laughs> repent because he's like fire. You know what I mean? But I, that night I was just tired and whatever. I was there. And she came out of there and she was just like, I got I to get my life. I got to get baptized. I got to, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, all right. I'm like, well, perfect timing. I go, tomorrow we're doing our first baptism down in Pirate's Cove. So I anointed her with oil, and uh, she came to the Pirate's Cove the next day, dunked her, bam. I, she was a sinner, so I held her under a long time. I was like, <laughs> five, ten minutes, you know, brought her up, didn't give her another dunk. No, but, uh, no, she, she's a good girl, but um, basically, uh, she gave her life to Jesus, and after that, I was like, it's on and popping now. I'm going to date you. Now, it's true. So I started dating her, and fast forwarding, you guys know the story. God started working like crazy, and uh, I was like, man, I think this chick's the one. You know, I didn't kiss a girl for six years. I didn't even, like, I, I hung out with a couple girls just to kind of see what it was like, but I didn't hold hands. I didn't kiss them. I didn't do anything because I knew I'm the kind of guy that would get in a butt naked wrestling match. So I was like... I'm cool, you know, let's just be friends. Are we dating? No, we're, fr we're hanging out. That's what I call it, hanging out, relax, you know? So, uh, but I, was, uh, I wasn't in any kind of relationship, so I'm dating her, and I'm like, man, this might be the one. So I'm like, God, give me a sign. I'm just a stupid human. I can't figure it out. Yeah, I've made so many mistakes. I'm dumb, you know? I don't get it. I'm hard-headed, you know? I'm like, I need a sign, like a lightning bolt or like some kind of crazy sign from heaven. And what happens is, I'm at dinner one night with her on my birthday, and we've only been, well, first we were hanging out for uh, about three months, and she'd be like, so, like, are we dating or what? Because, like, I have other guys, you know, that, you know, they're interested, and, and I'm like, I got other girls. Like, what are you talking about, you know? What are you talking about, you know? And I'd be like, go date your guys. I don't care. Whatever. We're hanging out. If you can't deal with that, then we ain't hanging out no more. That's what I thought. Well, you want to kick it still, right? Right. So we're hanging out. And uh, basically, then I, you know, I start dating her after that whole situation because I see the fruit in her life. You know, Jesus says, I'm the vine. If you remain in me, uh, you will produce good fruit. Your life will show that you're in Christ because when you, the fruits of the Spirit is like love, gentleness, kindness, patience, long suffering. And there's, these, there's a couple other ones. I can't remember them right now. But anyway, uh, the thing is, you see fruit in her life, and she, like, she had, God was inside of her. So I started dating her, then I was at, this is only, like, maybe a couple weeks after we started dating. We're at my birthday, and uh, party, or actually, it's not a party, it's just me and her, we're on a date. She gives me a card, and inside the card, you know, it has, like, a little love letter thing from her, and then at the bottom, it says, Second Chronicles 16.9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I was like, where in the heck did you get that? 
Because I, I know she only read five chapters in Mark or in, in Matthew. She's been to church like four or five times. You know, she watched the whole Bible movie in two, two days. She kept calling me, oh, I'm crying. I'm like, why are you crying? King Saul, Saul and David. And I'm like, that's not even a scene you're supposed to be crying on. But I knew it was the Holy Spirit. I knew it was the Holy Spirit working in her life. So I was just like, cool. I was like, cool, God, just get her. Just, you know, take it to her, you know? But uh, so I'm like, where'd you get this verse? And she's like, well, she goes, I Googled six. Uh, she, go she goes, I Googled encouraging verses online. And this is, uh, she had like 60 of them. And she said, I kept reading them over and over. But this is the one that kept popping off the page to me. So I put it down. And I go, man, I go, that is crazy. Because I go, when I got saved, you know, about six months after I, uh, about, I think it was like six months after I got saved, I got an iPhone when the iPhone first came out. And I came across that verse, I heard in a study or something, and it was 16, it was that verse, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I put that in my phone in the sticky notes. And that's been the only verse in my sticky notes, my life verse, for the last six years. So I pulled it out, and I'm like, and I know she wasn't, she didn't go on my phone, I can tell you that, because some people are like, she went through your phone, what a psycho. No, she didn't go through my phone. She didn't go through it, and I pulled it out, and I said, look, this is the only verse. This is my life verse, and I knew at that, that time. I go, okay, God, that's a sign. I told her straight up. I said, hey, we're going to get married. Let's plan on getting married. <laughs> you just advanced from hanging out to marriage. We just skipped the whole program here. <laughs> so I got married to her. Best thing that ever happened. There is a God because she's way out of my league. And I don't even know why I told you guys that story, because I wasn't even going to say anything. But I guess just want to encourage you guys, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed. Not, he's not looking for the people that are religious, the people that got it all figured out, the people that, you know, the sinners. He's not, he just says fully committed. So no matter what you're going through in your life, whether you're a Christian or not, whether uh, you're a Christian struggling, trying to get, you know, come out of drugs and alcohol or these things, or anger, bitterness, or maybe you've been molested, maybe suicide, these things. If you're fully committed to God, Jesus said, seeking you will find. Knocking the door will be open. He'll open himself. He's like, dude, I want to come in and sup with you. And basically saying, I want to come in and break bread with you. I want to, I want to kick back and eat with you. What happens when you're, okay, who, what's the best kind of food? What, what, what food do you love? Uh, Mexican. Mexican, okay. Now, you know the bombest Mexican spot, right? You got your spot. Like, you'll drive, like, to East L.A. if you have to, to go eat this Mexican restaurant, right? That's the way I am. Like, dude, I'll drive an hour for these dang, for this, this, this salsa that they make in La Puente. Oh, man. Or, like, Taco Ready Tacos out there, too. So Jesus is like, hey, basically, I want to go to your finest restaurant that you love, your taco spot. I want to sit down and chill. And what happens when you go there, you show up, you're just like, oh, this is amazing. You're hanging out with your friends, and you're just having the best experience of your life, right? That's where it goes down. Jesus is like, I want to come in and break bread with you. I want that mo most, having the most ex amazing experience with you. I want to talk to you. I want to help you through your issues. I'm your rock. What issues are you dealing with? I've come to set the captives free, Jesus said. You got a drug problem? I'm going to set you free. You don't got peace? I'm going to give you peace and rest for your soul. You need help? I'm going to give you guidance. You need wisdom? It says, ask our generous God in James. And if you need wisdom, he'll give it to you. He won't rebuke and say, stupid Ryan, why are you asking me? What, what's up with you? He's like, you want it? Okay, I'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. That's what he wants to do. And that's what he does in our lives. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ every single day that we walk with him. It's a relationship. I wake up. Right when I wake up, I go on these walks. I go through the hills. I told you about those walks. I walk with God. I'm listening to a Bible study with Papa Chuck. And my God, just speak to me through Chuck, whatever you're saying through your word. Then I turn off my headphones and I kind of talk to him. Hey, God, dealing with this today, man. I want to pray for these guys. I want to pray for my friends, my mom and dad. You know, help me with my anger problem that I was dealing with two weeks ago. Keep that down. Keep that old man down. And I talk to him. And he answers his prayers. And that's what it is. You read, you pray, you grow. He wants to come in and sup with us, you guys. So I just want to end that there. Um, wasn't going to share that, but that's that. Um, let me tell you about my trip really quick. Like let's, um, I'm going to play a video really quick. There are a couple minute clip, uh, video clips each. This is uh, Ray from Corn. I was uh, actually on tour with Slipknot and Corn this weekend. And I'm going to tell you the stories after. But I, was, I snuck on stage and I got right up to the drum set. Uh, so here it is. Make a crazy face. Whoa. I 
thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, so anyway, let's put up the first photo. Or the, yeah, that was the video, so where's the first photo? Oh, okay, we're going to go backwards. People in the back are doing everything backwards. So this photo that you're looking at, we, uh, we um, basically got one out there right when we got out there. Um, we went to the VIP, the meet and greet, and right when we walked in, there were some whosoever's in line there. Got to talk to them, and then uh, as, as the band was going around doing the meet and greet and saying what up to everyone, we walk out, and Fieldy comes up to me. He's like, hey, dude, there's this guy that looks like he has death on his face. Like, something's going on with him. He's like, I could just tell something, something's not right with him. So I go, dude, call him out, dude. Let's, just, let's talk to him. So he calls him out, and we meet up with him, and uh, basically we're, we're just like, hey, dude, what's, what's, what's up with you, man? Are you doing okay? And he just starts basically saying, man, I can't forgive myself. There's so much stuff I've done in my life. I've made so many mistakes. And he's just like, I, I want to kill myself. And so we just started talking to him and letting him know how much God loves him and he sees him and the thoughts that, of love that are towards him that God says he has. He says, thought, God's thoughts of love are more than the sands of the sea. We live by the beach, you guys. You know, we're out here in Orange County. Imagine all the sands and the whole sea around the world. That's the way that God's thoughts of love are for us daily, secondly, just over and over and over. We start telling him about it and then we, we give him a prayer and then he walked away with a big smile on his face. We're sending him a Bible and, uh, you know, Chuck Smith's devotional. And then uh, we went, um, then, uh, oh, I got to backtrack really quick. Then the night I actually landed, I got to actually share my testimony with one of the Slipknot guys. Um, that just happened right out of the gates. Right when I got there, it was like divine appointment. I sat down. They showed up. Fieldy was showing those guys the, the Holy Ghost uh, video that they were in. And then after they came down to, to eat with us, and one guy was sober um, for a couple days or a month or something, and I just got to tell my story. And I don't know where those seeds land, you know, but I just throw out those seeds of, of what God did in my life. So I got to talk to that guy. We got to pray with this guy. And then after, what Corn's doing after all the shows of the tours, and the tour is called Prepare for Hell Tour, and uh, God had other plans. So we basically, um, after the whole concert, we went out to the main, the main um, floor where everyone starts walking out, and we're like, hey, man, Ted, Ted and Fielder are going to be out here after. And even before the show, when people were coming in, we were telling people, meet us over here by... By gate four, we're going to head and field, you're going to be out there. So after the concert, all these people start showing up, like a big mob of people. We come up, and then Head tells his story. And then I was with, like, the NFL guy. That guy right there was telling his story. He's an NFL player, a linebacker for the Jags. Um, and then I told my story. And then at the end, I just said, hey, dude, if you guys want Jesus, do you want the real thing? Throw your thumbs up, and, and uh, we'll accept the Lord right here. And that's what all these dudes are doing. They're all sticking their feet. There's actually way more people there, but that's a tight photo. So we just, we, just led him, we just led him to the Lord right there at, at the Prepare for Hell tour. So it was awesome. So that's what Head and Fieldy, and we don't need any more photos to get you guys, but uh, that's what Fieldy and Head have been doing. They, these guys are out there to reach into the darkest pit. And I'm going to tell you, you go to a knot fest or a slip knot fest, you're pretty much there. Um, unless the, I think the next step is to go to like a satanic black magic uh, mass or something. But you're there, for sure. You know, their new hits is The Devil Inside Me. But, um, yeah, we just got to love on those guys, and uh, we're just letting our light shine, just loving them, saying what up to them. And as God opens doors, we want to talk to more of them and just see uh, what God does. He's the one that saves people. We don't. You know, I can't say, hey, dude, you need Jesus, and I, I'm, I'm going to save you. It's, it's God that really opens people's eyes, their ears, and their heart to going, dude, I need God in my life. I need that peace. If not, you just... Continue through life, keep making the same mistakes over and over. I tried getting sober for like, sober six times in like 23, 23 years. It was a nightmare. I'd get sober for two days of weekend. Like, dude, I made it through the weekend. I'd be like, yeah, I made it through Friday. I just got to make it through Saturday, man. And then I got to hide from everyone and the whole deal. And God doesn't want you to live a life of bondage, hiding from people. He's come to set the captives free. You could go through your weekends. You can go hang out, not in those places because... You know, if you're weak, you're going to fall back into that. Wherever I go, I take someone with me because I don't want to get into any situation. You, you heard that story of Billy Graham where he went to check into his hospital, and he's a huge, big evangelist, if you guys haven't heard of him. He's an older guy. He went into his uh, hotel room, and he used to always send people to clear the rooms for him. He'd turn off the cable so no one could blame him for watching anything he didn't want, want to watch or anything nasty, and then he would have someone go in and clear the room so nothing sketchy would happen. Well, one of the rooms that they were clearing, a chick would jump out of the closet, like, in her underwear or naked or something. Before he went in, thank God his security or the people that cleared it took him out and then, you know, got him in. 
I don't want to get caught in a situation like that. You know, I'm married now, and I'm not trying to walk away from what God, where God has put me, you know. You got to make sure, um, be accountable. And if you guys are out here and you want to go out and, and, you know, you have some issues that you, from your past life, take someone, dude, that believes, like, you're not someone that's going to go, here, man, here, it's cool, one try is all good, just hook it up. Go with someone that believes like you. So that's that. Let's turn to Mark chapter, uh, Mark chapter 10. How's everyone doing, by the way? Good? Good? Awesome. Oh, dude, radio is going down. We just talked to uh, KKLA, and uh, K-Wave, we're going to do it on K-Wave on Saturday nights from 9 to 10, live feed, live show, but we talked to KKLA, and they're going to stream it live, too. This has never been done with, with these two stations. So we're going to cover, cover all of Southern California, first time ever in the history of KKLA and K-Wave. Is that crazy? God's opening doors. I was like this. I'm like, bite my nails. Hey, so do you guys think you could uh, broadcast it, both of you guys together? I don't know if it's ever happened. They're like, this has never been done, but we're down. I'm like, okay. So that's that. So we're, uh, but no, no one can close doors that God opens, though. That's the thing. It's like God's spirit is the one that pushes the movement, that pushes all of us. It's, it's him. He gets, he gets the glory. Let me get to Mark. Sorry, Mark 10. Tonight, we're talking about, we're going to start talking about divorce. Um, but just to cover up from last week, God was basic, Jesus was basically pouring into the disciples and saying, look at you guys. If something is causing you to sin, cut it off. And he would use the examples, the extreme examples of like, if your eyes are causing you to skin, sin, pluck them out. If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. If your feet are causing you to sin, cut them off. It's better to go into eternal life, into heaven, than to go into hell. It's better to go into eternal life with one eye or one foot or one leg than to go to hell where Jesus speaks about hell, you know, 260 to 300 times in the, in the New Testament. He refers to it. Why? Because it's a real place. And any of you guys that have been involved with drugs like me, has you see those black shadows of those demons show up in your room or you mess with the Ouija board or tarot cards or any of that darkness, you know that there's evil. You know that Satan exists and his demons. So... I don't have to convince you guys. And Jesus is basically convincing these guys, like, dude, cut off whatever's in your life so that you can go to heaven. And he's not literally saying cut off your hands and your eye. He's just saying it's so crucial that it's better to pluck your eye, about it, pluck your eye out and make it to heaven than to go into hell. And I told you guys, I gave you guys the easy way out. You know, if you're, if you're having problems, you know, getting wasted, dude, just don't go to the bar. Go the opposite direction. If you can't go to the grocery store without going to pick a bar, send someone else. Like, cut that off. If porn is driving you crazy, you know, like a lot of people are like, dude, I'm trying to quit my porn problem. And that's a huge issue in Details Magazine. They just did an article in Details Magazine saying that there's this whole generation of people that are trying to stop watching porn because it's ruining their marriage. It's ruining their relationship with their girlfriend. It's, it's, it showed a statistic. People that watch porn, like, for them to get excited, they have to keep switching girls. One girl just doesn't do it. So there's this whole generation, and it's going to get more and more with the younger generation, that people are trying to stop porn. And what do I tell people? Someone goes, man, I'm trying to watch porn, Ryan. I go, where do you watch it? On my iPhone. Okay, get rid of the internet on your iPhone. And they just look at me like dumb, like, you want me to get rid of the internet on my iPhone? <laughs> well, then keep watching porn. I don't know. You're the one who's coming to me. That, you got you to cut it off. That's what Jesus is saying. Cut it off until you get that. That, that strength to, like, not watch it. I was addicted to porn my whole life, dude. I, got, I, you know, I stopped watching it six months into my walk with God. But it was gnarly, you know? And, you know, Satan still comes in with his little thoughts. And all that porn's all on the hard drive, you know? Everything you put in, it's just there. You know, I can't remember my own name, my own birthday sometimes. But I can remember the porn scenes, you know? It's implanted. But I can tell you this, God is washing away. It's, it's getting less and less over the years. So... Who in the heck's over there? Someone way in the back? Lurking hard over there. <laughs> All right, here we go. Chapter 10. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea into the area east of the Jordan River. He's, re he's leaving Caesarea Philippi. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. What's amazing about Jesus, you guys, is that he not only is doing miracles, he's not, healing, he's not only healing people, doing miracles, He's pouring into his disciples one-on-one, -on -one, 
but he's also teaching the crowds. And what did Jesus say? He's like, I honor my word above my name. And his, there's power in the name of Jesus, but he's saying my word is gnarlier. He is word that became flesh. He came out of eternity. He's the word of God that became flesh, Jesus Christ. So he's teaching the people. It's very important. That's what we do here. I'm teaching you guys about Jesus. Verse 2, some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with a question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Now, the Pharisees are the religious people back, back then, and they had the word of God. And what they did is they came up with their own translations, which was in the Mishnah. So they, they read something, and what you're going to see right here is how they came up with their own translation. But I think God, you know, God's God, and I think he was pretty clear of what he wrote. And if God wrote, if these are the words of God, I don't think we need to tell someone what God meant. I think he meant what he wrote, right? So the Pharisees had that mission, and they're, now what they're doing is they're trying to trap Jesus. And I underlined tried. They tried. They couldn't trap him because he's the son of God. But they're trying to trap him because they want to find fault with him because they're miserable. Jesus has come in. He's going against a religious system. He's driving these guys crazy, and he's teaching love. He's healing people on the Sabbath day, which was against their customs. But they're basically taking away their glory because these religious people, they wanted to be, you know, at the city gates and, like, people to worship them. And they wore their expensive suits and their outfits. They prayed in public. Oh, God, thank you for hearing my prayers. And thank you that I'm not like these dirty sinners. They were all prideful and uptight. So these guys were like, dude, Jesus is taking our glory. He's teaching all these people. These, Jesus is going to put us out of business. Literally, these guys were in business, making money off people. And uh, Jesus wasn't having it. So they asked him, you know, what, uh, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them and uh, Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Jesus knows where they're pulling this from. It's, it's from, uh, it's from Deut Deuteronomy. So he asked them, what did Moses say about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said, a man, can, a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But they're, they're misquoting this, this scripture. What it does say is I read it, read it today in uh, Deuteronomy 24.1. It says, if you find... Um, uh, oh, now I forgot it. Um, uh, if she wasn't a faithful uncleanness, if you found her with uncleanness, you could divorce her. And what, what it was meant is if you find her uh, committing adultery, if she went out and slept around, if she went out and slept around on you, and you found out you could divorce her. But you know what happens when you divorce her? Back then in that law, they would actually stone her. So you were actually able to get remarried again because it wouldn't be committing adultery because she's dead. She doesn't exist. So he says, um, he says, um, they, they, they misquote it. You know, they say, uh, yeah, he said you can get, get a divorce. And some rabbis taught, you know, some of the rabbis were more spiritual and they taught, yeah, if she committed adultery on you, yes, you could commit it. But then other rabbis said, they, they interpreted, because remember these, these religious people would interpret the scriptures. They said, oh, what God meant was if you don't find favor with her anymore. Like, if she's not pretty enough, if you don't find, think she's pretty anymore, you could divorce her. If, you know, she wakes up in the morning, she's like, no makeup, and you didn't know that before. You got married, and you're like, yeah, um, here's your note. Thanks for coming out. Bye. <laughs> you know, but that's, that's what they taught. They taught basically, you know, because they, 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 just, they just wanted to get rid of their wife sometimes because they, you know, for whatever reason. So going on, Jesus says, but Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a uh, con uh, concession to your hard hearts. Jesus, God didn't write, didn't give them the way out because that was God's plan. God's plan was what went down with, God, with Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and be like, hey, I'm going to give you Eve because she's part, you know, I took the, the piece from your heart, like, the, you know, one of the ribs from your heart and created her. You're a man and she's woman because she was made the closest thing to your heart. Here she is, but, hey, Adam, don't trip. If she gets ugly, she could bounce. You just write her a letter, a letter of a divorce. <laughs> don't even worry about it. God didn't create that in Genesis, did he? No. He put this law later on in, in uh, Deuteronomy because man, as man started growing up in the world, they started getting hard hearts. So he put that law because of man's hard hearts. And what happens with people's hard hearts? You know, people that are married. You know, you get in fights. And you're like, oh, I'm over it. And you don't talk. And then you go to bed. And then you wake up the next morning. You don't talk again. And you start growing apart. And then what happens when you have kids? 
your, your kids are growing up on, on, under all this dysfunctional stuff that's happening now. They're seeing the two parents cussing each other out, yelling at each other. They're, they're growing up with all this stuff going, man, this is the way marriage is supposed to be. And then on top of it, a wife gets all, this guy, he, he, this guy's not paying attention to me, this and that. And the, what, the, the husband's at work, you know, make it, making the money for the family. Then she's at the gym doing her little you know, exercise and some guy rolls up. Hey, what's cracking, you know? you know? And the husband's like, she's like, my husband's a jerk. I'm over this guy, younger guy. Like, hey, what, what's, what's popping? You know, let's go hang out, whatever. Then they commit adultery. And then it comes out that they committed adultery. Now the kids are going crazy. The wife's over it. The husband's over it. God put this place, put this commandment in place that if all this stuff is going on and it's not getting better and it's just getting worse and worse and these two people have not agreed to try and work it out, he gave the way out so the whole family doesn't have to live a life of chaos. But God's intention is not for divorce. His intention is that if something happens, that you come together, number one, you repent. What does repent mean? It means a change the direction you were going. It's like if you skate, it's like to do a 180. Bam, you're going the opposite direction. You repent. And repentance is not just saying, oh, God, I repented from my sins. Help me, you know, that repentance, that's awesome for you. But true repentance is to see a change of heart, a change of mind, and fruit in your life. Because you could, you could go, you know, you could go hook up with some other chick or some other guy, a wife could hook up with a guy, and you could say, oh, I repent. But, but if there's not a true change of heart, that's not true repentance. And that goes for all of us in our lives. If we're having different sins in our life, you know, if you repent, that means you change your heart. You don't keep going back. True repentance is a complete change, a 180, a, a direction change. So he's saying it's because of their hearts. It's, this is not God's way. But verse 6, it says, but God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. So now he's quoting what happened in Genesis. This explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined with his wife. And the two are united as one. Since they are no longer but two, or since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So God's way is Genesis way. Man, woman, they're united as one and they become one. He permitted a way out because of people's hard hearts, but he wants it to be, he wants you guys to be united and not to be divorced. Verse 10, later when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. He told them, whosoever discovers his wife, sorry, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. He's basically saying, if you're married and you, if you're married and you just divorce your wife because you want another girl, you're, you're committing adultery, even if you haven't even slept with her or anything. If you left your wife for another wife, you're committing adultery, and that goes both ways. So, but now, we know later on in the story of the Gospels, there's this story of a, the girl that was caught in adultery. You remember that story where the girl was caught in adultery and the Pharisees and Sadducees brought her to Jesus to see what Jesus had to say about it? And he brought her and they said, hey, we caught this woman in adultery. What do you say we do? Because the law is if you catch a woman in adultery, you stone her. You kill her right on the spot. And what does Jesus do? Jesus throws out the grace card. And this is why I love Jesus so much. Because his grace and his mercy, because if I lived by the law, I would have been stoned a long time ago. But Jesus comes rolling on the set. He's like, what? What? She's caught in adultery? Oh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these guys, that, that they think they're all dope and uh, they think they got it all figured out and they're not sinners. I right, Watch this one. So he sits down and he starts writing in the sand. And it says that he wrote in the sand and it said one by one, they got up and walked away from the oldest or from the youngest to the oldest. Now, it doesn't say what they're writing, but I know that Jesus is the son of God and he knows everything. He probably started writing their names. John, lusting after so-and-so at the temple. <laughs> Frankie, getting wasted when no one's looking. <laughs> Billy, Billy Joe, whatever he did. And he just basically just started dismissing them. So they were probably like, yeah, we're going to stone her. Jesus, what? 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 I got to bounce. I can't. <laughs> oh, he says, anyone, he, basically what he told them is, Whoever, whoever doesn't have a sin, cast the first stone. That's what he told them. And then he wrote the names down. So they were like, oh, I'm going to smoke her. I'm cool. No one knows nothing. 
Billy Joe did this and that. Like, dang, I'm out, you know? And Jesus throws the whole grace car down. And then what does he say to the woman that was caught in adultery? And the best thing about this story is where's the dude that got caught in adultery? Where's he at? Was he one of these guys' friends? You know, they're all hooking up. They come over, hey, what's going on? Oh, my gosh, hey, let's stone that chick. Let's get her out of here, you know? What, where is the dude? These guys weren't even playing fair. The Pharisees and Sadducees weren't even playing fair from, from the get-go. Where's the dude? He's a sinner, too. Like, he got caught in, in adultery, too. So, anyway, what does Jesus say? He said, woman, where are your accusers? She's like, oh, they all bounced, you know? And uh, he's like, you have no accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And that is the root of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grace and mercy. Yes, you're good. I'm not going to accuse you. But go and sin no more. Repent. Don't go back. Do the 180. Don't go back to, to, from the direction you came. And you know the, king, the story of King David. I'm not going to go into that because I don't have time. Going on, verse... Uh, verse um, where is it? I'm lost. Was it verse 24? Verse 13? What? Oh, my page turned. Oh, oh, dang. Okay, sorry. My bad, my bad. Okay, here we go. Remember Crocodile Dundee? He's like, you can't take a picture of me. Oh, why? Is he going to mess with the spirit gods and all that? No, no, your lens cap's on. Uh, anyway, you have to be old to see that one. That dates me. I'm almost 40, losing it over here. Okay, here we go. Verse 13. Verse 13. One day some parents uh, brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. Back in that culture, you know, they would bring them to the rabbis and they would be like, hey, can you bless them? You know, sometimes, you know, I guess it'd be kind of considered if you want to come up and, you know, they, they give their kid, you bring your kid up stage on Sunday morning and they, Lord, bless, you, bless my child. He's just born and, you know, use him for your glory, you know, just kind of, kind of bless them. So they bring, bring the kids to Jesus to bless him. But the, uh, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with the disciples, and he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like the children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who, does, who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the child into his arms, and he placed his hands on their head, and he blessed them. He's basically saying, don't send the children away, because the children were secondary in that culture. They were just like, the women were secondary too. He was like, don't send them away. They're equally as important. You know, God has no favorites. He's no respecter of person. He loves everyone. He loves sinners. He loves gays. He loves drug addicts. He loves hookers. He loves Christians. He even loves the self-righteous Christians. He even loves them. He loves everybody. So he's saying, basically, if you want to come to the kingdom of God, you got to come like childlike faith. What happens with a child? Like, I have my nieces. They're real little. And they're like, we'll be somewhere or something happened. Oh, uncle, I'm scared. And I'm like, don't be scared. I'm with you. I'll protect you. I'll knock that dude out if something happens. Don't trip. And then what does the child do? They, their faith? Okay, it's all good. And they're not scared anymore. They believe. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You've got to be childlike. Not childlike like the child children that keep break, keep doing the wrong thing. You know, you keep spanking them for doing the same thing. Not childlike like that. Okay, good, I can get away. I'm like a child. I keep messing up. I keep, yeah, uh, uh, eat some ecstasy. Boots, boots, boots. Okay, I'm a child. Uh, nitrous balloons, you know. No, not like that, you guys. Not childlike. Childlike faith. Like, you, okay, I tell you, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he was raised on the third day and he sent this Holy Spirit to fill that empty void in your life. You've got to believe like a child. It's the gospel. Okay, God, I, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to believe by faith. And if you have that kind of faith, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says you've got to come like a child. Don't get caught up in all this, this nonsense of what the world tells you. Go follow the world. I, we were just teaching uh, last week about the world you know, Jesus said to be the salt of the earth because the world is, is rotting, it's corroding. Everything the world says to be and do just gives, makes you feel empty and that void in your life. Uh, you have to just not get caught up in all that stuff and just say, you know what, I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to surrender my life to you and see what you want to do. So come as a child. Verse 17, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him. He knelt down and asked God, teacher, what must I do to inherit kingdom life? 
Okay, so maybe some of you guys are here right now, and this is your first time, and you're like, okay, dude, well, I hear what you're putting down, but how do I inherit kingdom of God? Check it out. You're going to hear it from the Lord right here, from Jesus. He's going to break it down very simple for you guys. Now, the, man that, the guy that just came to him in Luke and uh, the other gospel talks a little bit more about this guy. He was a rich, young ruler, okay? This guy didn't have a drug problem. This guy wasn't living on the streets. He wasn't a bum. He wasn't an outcast, you know? This dude had it cracking. You know, if he lived at this day, he had the seven series, the rims, ten windows, the whole kit, you know, living down by the beach, some house, Huntington, you know, wherever, I don't know. Down by the beach, some million-dollar house or a $10 million house. This guy didn't really have much to, uh, to worry about. Um, he, uh, he had a lot. He had, the, he had the riches, the things of the world. And he goes, uh, kneeled down before God, Jesus, and asked the teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So he's basically saying, hey, I'm God. But, he, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely, lie. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. So this is the nuggets, how you would enter eternal life. And I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot do these things unless you have the Holy Spirit in your life. Because, man, there's not one of us that are good. Our heart is deceitfully wicked. No matter how good I try to do, I always do bad. You've heard about Paul. He says, my body appetites lust against my flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. My spirit life wants to do good. I want to follow God. I want to be a good person. I don't want to do all these negative things. But my flesh, my body appetites keep drawing me back. They keep enticing me back. And there's no way... You can live this kind of life and not do those things until you have the Holy Spirit in your life. And you will make mistakes, because we all do, but they'll get less and less. And we'll never be perfect until we inherit the kingdom of God, until we go to heaven. Verse 20, teach of the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments as a young boy. So the, the, you know, the Bible scholars believe this guy could have been a Pharisee or a Sadducee or something. So he, he obeyed all these, these commandments since, since he was a young boy. Verse 21, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Dude, I love that. And that's the way God looks at all of us. He felt, feels genuine love. This guy's really trying to find Jesus. He wants to inherit the kingdom of God. He's like, dude, I mean business. Like, he's kneeling down in front of God. He's like, dude, tell me. You know, when you're kneeling down in front of someone, you're beg pretty much begging someone, right? So he came with the, with the right heart, the right mind. God, how? I've, I've, obeyed all these, I've obeyed all these things. So Jesus felt genuine love for him. There, uh, then Jesus says, there is still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor and you will have the treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. You're probably going, what is going on right now? This guy's rich. Go sell everything. What is, what, Jesus, what's, what's happening right now? Well, Jesus right now, is, he's, he's dealing with a heart issue. This is, a, this is his particular, uh, this is this guy's issue. Now, we all have Jesus was speaking to every single one of us, it'd be something different. This guy, he's obeyed all the commandments. He's, he's, he's lived a good life, but he's a rich man. He has tons of possessions. You know, his, his God, basically God's calling him out. Like, the thing that's holding him back from following God is his God is money, his possessions. What is our God? What's holding you back from following God? Is it money? Is it possessions? Is it your girlfriend? Oh, you know, I want to follow God, but, you know, I'm dating my girl, and, you know, you know, we, you know, we got this thing going on, and I know God doesn't approve of the way we're living our lives. You know, we're doing a lot of crazy things. What's holding you back from following God? This guy's problem is it's his money and his possessions. Verse 22, at this, uh, at this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This guy couldn't do it. He couldn't follow Jesus. He couldn't do it. He says that he got sad, he turned his head down, and he walked away. He couldn't surrender to God. Imagine that. And there's some people here, they're going to walk out of here sad with their face down and go, you know what? I can't, follow, I can't follow Jesus. I just can't do it. And that stinks for you guys because if you want to start living, follow God. That's where the real life is. Verse 23, Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easy, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus, is, Jesus isn't saying for a camel to actually go through a needle of a sewing needle. Um, back in those days, when you go to a city, they had the main gate that they would close at night because that's what, that's what uh, protects the city. But they'd have a smaller gate. So if you showed up to the city late at night, you can go through the smaller gate. And it's saying it's easier for a camel to go through that gate than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's a small gate. You char- Camels are stubborn, man. Those things spit on you. Have you guys went to Israel with us or Egypt, any of you guys? Those things will spit on you. Those things are stubborn. So imagine trying to put a ca- stubborn camel that's huge through this little gate. And it takes like 10 guys pushing the thing through, spitting on them, kicking them, doing whatever. You know, those things spit like crazy. But he's saying it's easier for a camel to go through than a rich man. Why? Because a rich man is caught up in all these possessions. They don't want to walk away. And it's not, not, let me say this. Jesus isn't asking you if you're rich to sell everything and follow him. It's whatever is God in your life that's replacing him. If it's your girlfriend, as if it's, you know, greed, your anger, your money, whatever it is, if this stuff is, is overtaking you, if it's sports, you're like, dude, I'm dedicated to sports. I don't got time for God right now. I'm an athlete, this and that. Well, dude, that's your God. God wants to do everything. Everything that you're into, God has put those desires in you. He created you with those things. I love skating. I love surfing. I love going to concerts. I like music. I like art. You know, God put those, those desires in there. When I came to God, I said, God, I don't know, whatever you want to do in my life, you know, I like throwing music festivals. I like the skate courts or I like all art culture. Like, you know, I was like, you know, I, I, was, I was hoping, I'm like, God, I hope, you know, I hope I'm like not this boring Christian, man. This is going to really stink. But as I started following him, dude, I'm doing 100 times the more I was doing before I was even walking with God. So what he's saying here is like, it's, you have to surrender. And it's hard for a rich man to come through, but it's, it's, but it's, uh, it's hard for a rich man to go through. It's easier for a camel to go through. Verse 26, the disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they said, they asked. Who in the heck could be saved? Verse 27, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, is it impossible? But not with God. Everything is possible with God. Humanly, it's impossible to get saved. But through God, anything is possible because God is the one that tugs on our hearts. God's the one that reveals himself. God's spirit is the one that draws him to himself. But by man's effort, oh, I'm gonna be a good person. I'm not gonna do this and that. Dude, try and be good. It's gonna last for like 24 hours, if that. Because our nature constantly drags us to be a bad person because our heart is deceitfully wicked. Who knows it? Only God. Verse 28, and then Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you, he said. Yes, Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who has given up a house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or poverty, uh, property, for my sake and for the good news, which is the gospel, will be given, now even return, 100 times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. And in this world to come, that person will have eternal life. But uh, many of you who are the greatest now will be the least important, and those who seem to be the least important now will be the greatest. He's saying, basically, if you give up everything for my sake, if you surrender and you just follow me, and you give up everything for my sake, that he's going to give you back 100 times more. And I think I just quoted it. I think I said I'm doing 100 times more than I was. And it's true. I'm living proof. You know, some of you guys that know me, yeah, I did a lot when I was, when I was not walking with God, but now I'm doing so much. And, dude, I'm having the best time of my life. And things happen. Trials and tribulations come. But, dude, when those storms come, I'm so stoked that I don't have to look at the storm and go, how in the heck am I going to get out of this? What's going to happen next? I go, all things are possible with God. I know that you're my rock. I know that you see me because the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed. God, I don't got it figured out, but I'm fully committed to you in this storm. And dude, when I go through that storm, God's going to bring me on the other side. He's going to walk with us through the shadow of death. And what I love about that shadow of death, sometimes you feel like you're going to die or things are going to fall apart. If there's a shadow, what casts a shadow? That means that there's a sun close by. And Jesus is the son of God. He's the light. So when you're going through that, you may feel like you're in that dark time and you're in that shadow of death. God is close by with you and Jesus is going to walk with you. And I'm going to end it here, you guys. There's anyone here that wants to receive Jesus Christ and you're like, receive? What does that mean? You need to be born again. Whoa, dude, you're tripping me out right now. You said born again? 
What do you mean? Born again means that right now, if you're not walking with God, if you don't have a relationship with God, the universe, you're, you're just a man. You have a spirit in you, but you're, it's dead. You're just flesh. You're like, a, you're like an animal. You're, you're going after your body appetites. But when you give your life to Christ to be born again, Jesus sends his Holy Spirit, and he comes inside of you, and he becomes one with you. And that Holy Spirit will give you peace. He leads you and guides you when you ask for him. He speaks to you. Those addictions that you have, you say, God, in your word, you said that you set the captives free. You've, you've, come, to set the, you set, you've come to set people free. You say, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, take away my addictions, and he will. And when you see something on TV that makes you jones for it, or you see your friends do it, you say, God, help me in the name of Jesus to overcome that, and he will overcome that. How do you think I stopped smoking crack? How do you, thought I, uh, how do you think I stopped smoking heroin and shooting heroin? How do you think I stopped eating Xanax like Tic Tac? How do you think I stopped drinking every single day since I was like 15 years old unless I had like alcohol poisoning from a Vegas run, you know? How do you think I stopped those things? Because I became accustomed to this is the way I live. It was the power of God in my life, and God is not religious. He's not religious. He just wants to come in and break bread with you. He wants to come and hang out with you and help you. He wants to be the Lord of your life. So if you want that and you're here and you're tired of being tired, you're tired of making the same mistakes over and over, you're tired of your, you're not being the right woman in your, in your marriage, the right husband in your marriage, you're tired of not being the right boyfriend or girlfriend in your relationship, you're just tired of things that are going on and you guys can all identify what you're tired of being. And you want it to be transformed. You want that new walk with God. And you want peace. And you want rest. And you want that mercy. You know the way Jesus looks at people. He's like, I don't condemn you. All your condemners are gone. So now sin no more. That's all he wants you to do. Just go and just follow Jesus and stop sinning. Repent. Repent is a great word. It just means to change the heart. That's it. If you want that, you put your thumb up. And I want to pray for you. Right on. I see you. Anyone else? Cool. Right on. Right on. Right on. I see you back there. Anyone else? If you want to come back to God, if you're maybe even walking away from God because life's crazy and you get, we, we get ourselves in situations that suck sometimes and we fall away from God and then we think, oh, God's judging me. He hates me. Well, the Bible says that I, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. He doesn't condemn. He saves. And you want to come back to God tonight, you stick your thumb up and I want to pray for you. If you want to come back to the Lord Cool, I see you in the back too. Right on. Right on. I see you in the very back. Cool. Cool. Okay, you guys, repeat this prayer after me. I want to just lead you in a prayer, and you're going to invite Jesus into your life. And this is going to be the beginning of a new chapter in your life. Old things pass away. All things become new. You're going in a new life. Wherever you're at in your book, in your life, you're in a new chapter starting now. Jesus says, I get your sins. And I cast them into the farthest, deep, deepest part of the ocean. I cast them as far as the east is to the west, and I bring them up no more. Anything you've ever done, he washes you white as snow with the blood that was shed on the cross. You're a new creation. So when you start hearing those thoughts, oh, you're not good enough. Look what you've done. Because you're going to walk out of here, and Satan's going to come to you and say, oh, you can't be a Christian. Look at you. Look at the way you live. Look at this and that. Dude, he's a condemner. Jesus does not judge you. He loves you. And there's things in your guys' life that you may have addictions and stuff, but God's going to walk with you as you come out of that. You, some of you are going to walk out of here set free. It's going to be a done deal. And if you guys got drugs or anything on you tonight, bring them up here. Not now, but bring them up here and throw them, on the, throw them up here. Pipes, drugs. I was at a rehab the other day, and a guy had an eight ball of Coke. And he get, he's like, come to my car. <laughs> Poured it out. I stomped it out so he wouldn't come back and try and sniff it later on. <laughs> bring it up here and leave that stuff with me, and I'll throw it in the trash. Whatever it is, God will set you free, and as, as you go through it, you're going to start crawling. When you walk with God, you start crawling, then he's going to teach you how to walk, and then he's going to teach you how to run. But what happens when a baby starts crawling, then he gets up to start walking, what happens? He starts walking all tweaked because he, he's learning how to walk, and he falls over, and he's like eh, laying on his back, drooling on himself. The father doesn't go, stupid baby, you're supposed to walk. I just lifted you up, now walk and run. What does the father do? Picks him up, right the drool off, and has him walk again. Then he, he pins it and falls over again. You pick him up and he keeps walking until he learns how to walk. That's what Jesus is going to do with you in all of our walks. He's going to teach you how to crawl. Then he's going to teach you how to walk. And then he's going to teach you how to run. And when you run, sometimes you get jacked. You trip. Someone trips you, a good friend or whatever, trips you. But you get, you fall down and you get back up. 
And what you always look forward because you're going forward. You're not going backwards. You're not going that direction. That's your old life. You're going in that new direction that God has called you. So repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus. Everyone say it out loud. Say, Jesus. Please forgive me, Lord, for all my sins. I want to accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Transform my mind. Transform my heart. Renew me. Show me what you want to do in my life. And thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome, you guys. All right. All you guys that have stuck your thumbs up, I want you guys to get up and go over here. Cruise with me over here. I want to give you guys a free Bible and show you where to read and get you guys plugged in. It'll take five minutes. So if you're with friends, they're gonna, by the time the song's over, you guys will be out. All you that stuck your thumbs up, stand up and follow me this way. Let's do this. Come on.